In this module, we will begin discuss to discuss electromechanical systems, in particular sensors. So far in this course, we've modeled electrical systems and mechanical systems. In this module, we will begin to discuss systems that have aspects of both electrical and mechanical systems, i.e. electromechanical systems. We will first begin with sensors in this module, and in a subsequent module we will talk about electromechanical actuators. In this module we will also talk about how the sensor fits into the larger measuring system, and how the aspects of the measuring system affect the analysis and design of control systems in general. Most control systems, including automotive control systems, include electrical and mechanical components. Here in the figure shown, we have an example feedback system with the typical elements of a control system. If we look at this, there are components that are in the electrical domain and there are components that are in the mechanical domain, and we need components that are able to convert between these two domains. For example, the controller itself is usually implemented in the electrical domain, either as a circuit or in software. While it might be the case that the system that's trying to be controlled is a mechanical system. For the purposes of discussion, let's presume that we have a, a cruise control system. So in this situation, you could imagine that the driver has some sort of knob or something on the dash which he uses to set the desired speed for the cruise control. And so what he needs is he needs some sort of device that converts the turning of the knob into an electrical signal that can be read by the electrical controller that controller then generates a voltage which controls an electromechanical system for example a motor that's attached to the the throttle valve and so by changing the voltage the controller affects the setting of the throttle thereby allowing more or less air and more or less fuel into the engine that in turn causes the engine to change speed that speed, which is a mechanical quantity, then needs to be converted back into an electrical quantity in order to be read into the controller. And that needs to be done with an electromechanical sensor. So for this particular example, where the controller is implemented in software and we're trying to control a mechanical system, we need three electromechanical quantities. A transducer, and a sensor, and an actuator. In this module, we will in particular discuss sensors and transducers, and in a later module, we will discuss electromechanical actuators. At this point, we'll now go ahead and list a few examples of sensors and transducers that are electromechanical. Uh, go ahead and take a second and think to yourself if you've encountered any examples of sensors or transducers that are electromechanical in your job or in previous coursework. One class of electromechanical sensor relies on piezoelectric materials. These are special materials that produce charge when deformed, for example, quartz crystal. These can be used in things like an accelerometer to measure acceleration, in a microphone to measure basically sound. The microphone uh, generates a voltage output in proportion to the pressure wave created by a sound wave. Uh, load cells can also use piezoelectric materials to measure uh, to measure force. Another class of sensor works on the basis of the fact that electrical properties of some materials change with mechanical properties. For example, a thermistor works on the basis of its resistance changing with temperature. A strain gauge works on the basis of its resistance changing with deformation or stretching. And pressure transducers generate electrical signals in proportion to pressure based on changes in resistance or capacitance or inductance, depending on the construction of the transducer. Other sensors rely on electromagnetic induction, um, that is, that the motion of a conductor through a magnetic field can induce an EMF, a voltage. Examples of these include 
LVDTs, linear variable differential transformers, and resolvers. A final class of sensors relies on special materials that produce charge in response to light. This includes optical encoders and digital cameras uh, consisting of an array of CCD elements of charge coupled devices. At this point we'll go ahead and pick a few examples electromechanical sensors that are of particular importance to automotive and electric vehicle applications. A common inexpensive type of sensor used in many applications is the potentiometer. With the potentiometer the mechanical quantity of, of position is changed into a change in resistance and in particular it can be used as a voltage divider to generate a voltage that's proportional to the change in position. One automotive application of such a sensor is, is to measure the position of a pedal. So looking at this figure, we have a resistance element. And that resistance element has a total resistance R. As the slider moves, it changes the amount of resistance uh, on the left of the slider and on the right of the slider if we apply a voltage across the potentiometer then the voltage that's generated at the output will change as the slider changes. The circuit diagram representing that is shown below but more simply it all derives from Ohm's law. So we have some constant voltage E sub i, we have some constant total amount of resistance R and so the amount of current through the potentiometer is a constant amount I. As the slider moves, the amount of resistance R2 changes, and that causes the amount of voltage across R2 to change. So more specifically, the output voltage is equal to R2 times the current through the resistor, which follows from Ohm's law. The input voltage, however, is across both R1 and R2, which are in series. And if you think back, when we have resistors in series, their resistance is add. And so the ratio of the output voltage to the input voltage is shown here, where the currents cancel. And we get this relationship that shows how the change in pedal position, or the change in angular position of the slider, causes a change in the output voltage which can be measured. This concept of a voltage divider was also introduced when we were talking about complex impedances. Another type of sensor is the optical encoder. and This type of sensor can be used to measure displacement or velocity. So specifically the optical encoder consists of a light source called the emitter and it generates some light um, and then there's some material that has gaps in it between the emitter and on the other side we have what we call the detector. So as this material moves it alternately blocks the light and lets the light through. When the light is able to go through one of these gaps and reach the phototransistor, the phototransistor acts like a switch and it closes and it causes the output to go high. When the light source is blocked by this material, then the phototransistor acts like an open switch and the output goes low. And so by counting these pulses, we are in essence able to count the number of of gaps and blocks that move past the, the light source. And that gives us an indication of the displacement of this material. If we look at how many pulses we count in a certain time period, then that frequency gives us, gives us a measure of the speed of this material. Furthermore, if we have multiple pairs of emit emitters and detectors that are offset from one another, we can also measure the direction that the material is moving. And that's shown in this slide. 
So in this slide we have a rotary encoder. So we have this disk of material with gaps and blocks. We can also have linear encoders. But in this case we've got a rotary encoder and we have two emitter detector pairs. One located at point A and one located at point B. When this disk is moving counterclockwise what will happen is this material will block the pair at location A first and then the pair at location B second. And so when it blocks the pair at A, that channel will go low. Then subsequently the channel at location B will go low. If we're rotating in the opposite direction, however, clockwise, then this material will hit the pair at location B first then the pair at location A second. Therefore, channel B will go low first, and then channel A will go low. Therefore, looking at these two pulse trains, and looking at which of the pairs goes low first, we're able to determine the direction that the encoder is moving. If we add additional channels, we can also improve the resolution of the, of the encoder how many pulses we get for a given change in angular displacement. Many types of sensors, and actuators too, employ the principle of electromagnetic induction. One aspect of this is that a changing electric field generates a magnetic field, and conversely, a changing magnetic field generates an electric field. These two facts make sense because both types of fields are simply different aspects of, of the same thing, electromagnetism. The presence of an electric field causes an EMF, an electromotive force, a voltage that, that generates current. And this is often the basic principle uh, that sensors use. While a magnetic field can be used to generate a force, and this is often the principle that's used by actuators. One reason this, this property is so nice is because it's, it's non-contact. And this will become um, more clear, the usefulness will become more clear uh, shortly as we discuss a few specific examples. So one type of sensor that employs electromagnetic induction is, is the resolver. A resolver can be used to measure angular position. And the way that it works is that you have some carrier voltage, some input voltage that's an AC signal, an alternating current. And that changing electric field uh, creates a magnetic field, and that magnetic field then induces current in, in a rotor. And so this is, in essence, a transformer. This is how a transformer works. This AC current, this alternating current, creates a magnetic field and that changing magnetic field creates a current in the, in the pickup. And so we generate some current in this pickup coil that's attached to the rotor, for example, in the middle of a motor. And then this current induces another magnetic field, which induces current in these two pickup coils, one called the cosine winding and one called the sine winding, and these are fixed on the stator of the motor. The fact that these two pickup coils are offset uh, causes the, the current that they generate to change differently as the rotor moves. And in particular, the relative magnitudes of the currents in these two outputs can be used to determine the position of this rotor throughout its, its 360 degrees of motion. Here's an example where we can see how the non-contact aspect of electromagnetic induction is nice. You know, we have this rotor in the middle of a, a motor and it's spinning and we're able to sort of get current to it without a physical connection. Another type of sensor that works on the same principle is called a Linear Variable Differential Transformer, an LVDT. This type of sensor measures translational displacement. It's similar to the resolver 
in that the source is an alternating current and so we have this sort of primary coil here um, so this alternating current creates a changing magnetic field and that magnetic field then induces current in these two pickup coils so we call this the primary and it induces voltage or current in these two secondary coils. As this metal rod, you know, of some sort of ferrous material in the core moves, is displaced, it affects the way that current is induced in these two secondary coils. In particular, the amplitude of the output voltage is proportional to the position of this core and that gives a, a means for detecting displacement. Furthermore, the phase of the output voltage changes direction whether the core is moving one direction or the other direction. Another type of sensor that doesn't work on quite the same principle as a resolver or an LVDT is called a Hall effect sensor. So this is a Hall effect sensor and it can be used to measure the strength of a magnetic field. And since current generates a magnetic field it can be used as a sensor. It can also be used to measure speed or position. So for example you can imagine this gear is spinning and as these teeth pass the Hall effect sensor, the teeth sort of change the magnetic field. And that change in magnetic field can be detected by this sensor. So in essence, you can get these pulses every time a tooth passes by. And so this can be used you know, to measure speed or position, for example, for crankshaft timing or for anti-lock brake control. And so if you've seen inside a vehicle, um, you can find a sort of gear like this in the in sort of the hub of a wheel. And, in, and what it's basically doing is it's a wheel speed sensor. It's measuring how quickly this gear in the hub is, is rotating. For those of you that, that do any sort of cycling um, and you have these little computers on your bike that you can use to measure uh, your speed or how far you've traveled, the way that it works is, in essence, um, you have a you put a magnet on your spoke, and you put a pickup on the fork of your bike, and so every time this magnet passes by the pickup, passes by the forks, you generate a pulse using a Hall effect sensor, and it counts these pulses um, to get displacement, and it times the the frequency of the pulses to get your speed. Another type of component that can be used as a sensor is an electric generator. And so this is a picture of a generator. It has the same structure as a motor. Um, with a motor, you apply a voltage to the system to generate motion. With a generator, it works in the opposite way. Motion generates a current output. And so this generator can be used as a sensor because the voltage it generates, the EMF it generates, indicates the speed of the generator. At this point, I won't get into the principles uh, based on which this works, but that this is something we'll come back to uh, later. It's also worth noting at this point that a generator, for example, can be used to charge a battery. So if, if the vehicle, you want to break the vehicle, you want to slow the vehicle down, you can use the vehicle to turn this generator, thereby slowing the vehicle down and generating electricity. So we've given a few examples of different types of sensors that are used in automotive applications. There are many more than the ones that we've, we've discussed here. But one thing you've noticed is that many of them do similar things, measure position or speed, for example. And so we need to choose between all of these different possibilities. And the way that we do that is using a range of criteria. 
how much does the sensor cost? How reliable is the sensor? How accurate is the sensor? That is, how close is it to the actual true value? Um, how precise is the instrument, is the sensor? Meaning, how repeatable is it? Um, what's the resolution? You know, what's the smallest amount of displacement that it can measure? What's the sensitivity? Um, you know, how much output is generated for a given change in the input? What's the range? What range of displacements can it measure? What range of speeds can it measure? And a final criteria, which may not be that intuitive, but which we'll talk about more in greater detail, is the speed of response of the sensor. So in general, it turns out that a change in speed or a change in displacement it does not cause an instantaneous change in the output of the sensor it takes time for the sensor to react. And so the speed of responses is an important quantity that needs to be considered. There are even instances where a quantity must be estimated without a sensor. And so the idea there is instead of physically measuring some quantity, you instead have a mathematical model that you use to estimate the quantity or to sort of predict the quantity. One reason why a sensor might not be available is, is just because it's prohibitively expensive. Uh, sometimes even uh, a sensor might not even exist. For example, um, there isn't really a sensor for measuring the state of charge of a battery. And so in a mathematical model, in essence, must be used to estimate that quantity. The use of an estimator can also improve reliability because, it, in essence, it can't break down. So far, we've basically just talked about sensors. But sensors actually are, are part of a, a larger measurement system. And there are different elements to this system, uh, the sensor itself, but also signal conditioning, and then a readout for the, for the system or, or computation for the system. And each element of this measuring system uh, may have dynamics, and it may introduce error. And so how these affect our larger control system needs to be understood. So the first stage of our measurement system is the sensor. Um, it's dynamic. Um, you know, it may not react instantaneously. The output of the sensor may take time to react when the quantity being measured changes. And so we may need to model the sensor as a transfer function or a differential equation to understand how the dynamics affect the larger control system. We also may need to do some signal conditioning on the output of the sensor. For example, we may want to filter the output of the sensor to get rid of noise. We may want to amplify the signal to make it larger in order to uh, drive an actuator um, or in order to improve the signal to noise ratio. We may also want to integrate or differentiate the signal. For example, maybe we're measuring velocity but what we actually want is position. So we need to integrate the velocity signal to get an estimate of the position. Or maybe what we actually want is acceleration. So we need to differentiate the velocity signal to get an estimate of acceleration. And we may also need to uh, do conversions between analog signals and digital signals. So a DAC is a digital to analog conversion, and an ADC is an analog to digital conversion. And each of these sort of operations may have dynamics to them, and they may introduce error that we need to understand. And then finally, this signal is then used to drive an output, you know, a gauge or some sort of uh, electronic display, or even to, um, you know, generate a sound from a speaker, or um, it's read into a computer, where the computer then may, may do some calculation or computation based on it. So here's a specific example of a measuring system with the three different stages. The first stage is the sensor, where our sensor is a, an accelerometer. And so let's say that this sensor is attached to our vehicle, and as the acceleration of the vehicle changes, the sensor generates a, a voltage output. And if we look at this, um, it turns out that the signal is noisy. 
So this very high frequency jumping around doesn't actually reflect the acceleration of the vehicle. The vehicle itself is not having its acceleration jump so, so drastically. What this is, is, is noise on top of the actual acceleration of the vehicle, you know, either due to electromagnetic interference or, or whatever. And so the first thing that we want to do with our signal conditioning is we want to filter out that noise. We want to send this signal through a low-pass filter to get rid of that noise. And that filtering can be done uh, with a circuit, an RC circuit, for example, uh, an op-amp circuit, or it could be done in software. And let's say that this acceleration signal isn't actually what we're interested in. What we actually need is an estimate of the velocity of the vehicle. And so one way to arrive at that is to integrate the acceleration signal. And then let's say that the magnitude of the signal is too small. And so we amplify it to, to scale the signal up. And so now we have this, this voltage. That's a, that's a reasonably large voltage and it's proportional to the velocity of the vehicle. And then we want to read this in to our computer on board our vehicle in order to generate some control commands. And so in order to take this smooth analog continuous signal and read it into a digital computer, we need to do an analog to digital conversion. Specifically, um, we're just going to take this continuous signal and we're going to sample it at different periods of time. And then this stage three, the computer can then use these inputs that it's reading in to, uh, to calculate different things. Each stage of this measuring system, of this measurement process, can introduce error and can introduce dynamics. And so we need to, in essence, understand the effect of each stage. We will look at a, a few specific examples. So one example is the process of numerical integration. So just like in that previous example, maybe this is an acceleration signal and we want to estimate velocity. Or conversely, maybe this is a velocity signal and we want to estimate position. So this signal isn't necessarily something that we can uh, represent by a standard function, uh, an exponential uh, polynomial. You know, our, we're not driving our vehicle um, according to uh, AX squared plus bx. And so in order to perform this integration numerically, uh, we need to think back to what integration means graphically. And graphically, an integral is, is an area under a curve. And so a way that we can estimate this area under the curve, one simple way, is to basically take the curve and split it up into a bunch of rectangles. And so the area of these rectangles, if we sum them up, can be used to estimate the area underneath the curve. One thing that you'll notice is that this will introduce error, you know, just like we, we were sort of anticipating. You know, this rectangle sort of underestimates the area under the curve. This rectangle sort of overestimates the area under the curve. If the error in our signal is random, or if the, the signal itself sort of um, moves up and down, then these errors will often sort of cancel each other out. Here we underestimated, here we overestimated, those two errors approximately cancel out. However, if there's a bias in the measurement, so if the blue line is the true velocity, and the dashed red line is what our sensor is giving us, then we calculate this area. The longer we integrate for, the more this error builds up. And so this can be a real issue, and it's something we need to be careful about. If we have a bias in our measurement, numerical integration can introduce a large amount of error. And so a situation where this might occur could be, for example, let's say that we're using GPS. Um, somehow in our in our control algorithm, a GPS signal, a global positioning satellite. 
know, maybe we're a bus that's traveling a certain route and we're trying to uh, keep track of where we are along the route. But if for some reason uh, the bus goes in a tunnel or um, there's some sort of weather interference and that GPS signal drops out, then we may have to to find a different means for estimating our position. For example, we may integrate uh, our wheel speed signal or our estimate of the velocity of the vehicle. We may integrate that to estimate the position of the vehicle. But if we have to do this integration for too long, uh, the error can get quite significant. Another example of this is uh, submarines. So a submarine, you know, it goes under the polar ice cap. Um, or to sort of evade detection um, by, by another country or something. And it has to stay under the water for a month. Um, that whole time it's trying to sort of estimate its position by integrating a, a velocity signal, you know, maybe from a gyroscope, so that it knows where it is so it doesn't run into, run into land or an iceberg or something. And so you can imagine even if your velocity signal is very accurate, if you have to integrate it for a month, that error can really build up. Um, and so there are you know, quite advanced techniques for estimating this bias or compensating for this bias. Another type of signal processing that is often done is numerical differentiation. So again, let's say that we have a velocity measurement but what we really want is an estimate of acceleration. So you could take this velocity signal, differentiate it to get an estimate of acceleration. But just as was the case previously, uh, the signal, our velocity signal, doesn't match some known function. And so what we have to do is we have to numerically differentiate. And so think back to what a derivative is graphically. What a derivative is, is it's basically the slope of the tangent at a given instant of time. A simple way to estimate the derivative is to calculate the slope between two, two points, or two data points. And we get an estimate of the derivative, in this case of acceleration. And so as you look at this again, at any given instant, you know, the slope the instantaneous slope doesn't exactly match the slope between those two points. So again, this, this approach to signal processing introduces error. If our measurement signal has a bias to it, that bias won't introduce a large amount of error. The slope of the true signal is the exact same thing as the slope of the measured signal. However, if there's a lot of noise, for example in this signal, and we're estimating the slope between two points, you can imagine that this noise will introduce a lot of error. In fact, differentiating that noise can, in essence, amplify the the noise. So this is something that need, you need to be very careful about if you're numerically differentiating or differentiating a, a noisy signal. This is one reason why people are often sort of hesitant to use derivative control in their controllers. And so this is something we'll come back to later in the semester and talk about how to deal with it. Another type of signal processing that can introduce error is analog to digital conversion. So for example, we had that example where we had some continuous signal, an analog signal from a sensor, and we wanted to read it into a digital computer. And so the simplest way to do that is to simply sample that continuous signal periodically and hold that value. So let's say we're sampling every 10 milliseconds. And so over that 10 millisecond period, we're just going to hold that value. Doing that introduces error in a couple ways. 
One is it can introduce time lag. So in essence, you know, if I sample the velocity of my vehicle and I hold it for a period of time, by the time that I get to the end of that period, the velocity estimate I'm using is in essence old. It's no longer what the true velocity of the car is. The car has changed speed since 10 milliseconds ago. And so this lag can, can degrade the performance of a control system. And this is something that we need to understand. Something else that analog to digital conversion can do is it can introduce quantization error. So for example, you can imagine the number pi. Pi is an irrational number. In order to express it exactly, you need an infinite number of decimal places. But this would require you know, a computer that has more memory or computational power than, than exists. So at some point within a computer, you need to round off. And this introduces quantization error. You know, whatever processor you're using has a limited amount of precision, has a limited number of bits. And so at some point, you have to round off your numbers. And so here is a piece of data from an experiment that we're actually going to do in this class, um, measuring motor speed. And you can see that the motor speed is sort of jumping around between these three discrete values, 450, uh, 464, and uh, 436, let's say. The speed of the motor isn't actually jumping back and forth between these three discrete values. It actually is moving at a relatively constant speed. It's just that um, the speed is getting rounded between these three, these three values. Okay. So this brings us to the conclusion of Module 8. In this module, we discussed sensors. In particular, we discussed examples of electromechanical sensors sensors that are able to bridge the electrical and mechanical domains of our control system. We also talked about how they must be considered as part of a larger measuring system, that the output of a sensor may need to be processed in some way, and then it, it may need to generate an output or be read into a computer. And so each stage of this measuring system has dynamics and can introduce error, and we need to understand those we discussed in this, in this module um, a few different examples of signal processing and how they specifically introduce error and how we must be careful when we, when we use them in our, in our larger control system.